Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to that last uh, end of webinar. Um, these webinars uh, are very important, as I mentioned before, because they are in line with what I believe in, and it's uh, clinical excellence. So this is what you need to develop at this time uh, in your career. Um, today, what I would like to talk about is about the other activities that are going on right now within one dental unit. For sure, taking care of our patient is, is the foremost uh, priority and taking care of our people too. Uh, but right now, uh, there's uh, several one dental unit members that are involved in other activities. Uh, one of them are uh, to provide uh, contact tracing with uh, Health Canada and Public Health Ontario. We have 30 members that are actually involved at this time for the last two weeks. And they're, they're doing an outstanding job calling uh, patients that are in isolation at home and making sure they're doing well. Also, uh, you might be aware that we've just been approved by the Deputy Surgeon General uh, for dental officers and dental techs to perform extended duties. For dental officers, it will probably take the shape of uh, being involved in immunization and uh, be able to support our medical colleague in other roles too. The last one is a potential deployment uh, in Quebec and Ontario, uh, and that will be to provide support and personal help to uh, elderly in uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, so we have already identified over 60 members of one dental unit that volunteer for this task. And uh, we're looking forward to get the thumbs up so uh, we can deploy some of you guys and, and you'll be able to get involved. Um, I would like to conclude by telling you that it is great to wear our uniform as a dental officer. Uh, the reason being is that you can be all you can be as a dentist as an officer and as a person too who wants to serve others. And my suggestion to you or my advice to you is please take advantage of all these opportunities that are offered to you. Uh, it's, it's a chance on, in a lifetime, probably will not come back again. So if you want to uh, be all you can be, as I mentioned before, uh, jump on the wagon, take advantage of these opportunity, uh, learn from them, enjoy them, and uh, that will be, I'm sure, the highlights of your career as a dental officer. So on that note, enjoy uh, the last webinar, the end of webinar, and I hope you'll be uh, attending the other webinars. There's a lot of uh, people that are working really hard to provide you a high quality product and again, that's another example of the advantage of being in uniform. And so take advantage of that. So on that note, take care, everybody. Be safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Uh, talk about this really briefly. I'm not sure if you get this from your chain of command or not, but I wanted to, because we are a military family and it's critical that we all share this information. Our family, we're working together. Um, the most recent letter uh, from the CDS, and I was, I was fairly inspired about it because um, it's, you know, again, we're part of a family. So he talks about, this is just, and I just sent it in the chat if you want to see where this link is. So it's really important to understand that our main effort right now is don't become part of the problem. So we're staying at home, being healthy, and that's critical to understand that and really make that part of yourself because I'll tell you, I don't want to be at home anymore. I've had enough with schooling, but it's important for me to, you know, when I reflect on this, that it is critical because we will become, if we become part of the problem, then we're just not helping Canada as a Canadian Armed Forces. Hopefully I said that properly. And on one of the paragraphs under uncertainty, you know, it's critical to, to, to note that, and I'll read it right here. The thing that we can be certain about while staying healthy, staying connected to your leaders and colleagues and remembering how important you are to the long-term defense and security of Canada and our allies. So I wanted to bring that back because, you know, we're off on our own, doing our own thing in our, in our house, whether you're connected with your chain of command or not, I wanted to, to, to remind you and 
that we're all here together. We're part of a team and you are in Canadian forces. And you know what? Um, you're going to be called upon to care for our soldiers and also care for our patients or for our public potentially as well. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And if you have any problems, you're having any issues, you know, feel free to reach out to your chain of command. Also reach out to even Reagan and I, we are, we've been doing this for 20 years. So uh, if you feel uncomfortable talking to someone else, give us a shout. We're always here for you. That's, and that's really the part of this. So enough with that. Let's talk about glide path and cleaning and shaping. And I'm going to, so glide path, we've all known about it, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to show you a couple tips that have really made a difference. And I can be, this is my own quote that I was thinking about it was like, after years of trying to cheat the endo system, and I've tried every way you can imagine, the endo success comes down to one thing, and it truly is glide path. And I think, Reagan, you can probably agree to that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we teach together, and I'll tell you, you shortcut this bad boy, that's it. You're, the whole system, the whole game's over. You're done. Yeah, you're, yeah that's right. So... Um, this is, we're going to, the next video, it's going to be about 13 minutes and I'll post it online. There's a couple, I'm going to keep my piece short today I, and we'll talk about a couple other things, but really when you're looking at this, uh, we're going to do glide path on this, those, those plastic clear teeth. So when you take a look at it, just, you know, see, we're going to be working in the MB1 system and also the MB2. Oops. I don't know why it's not going. You can still see it in the small screen okay, so if you want to leave in. it at the We're going to talk about glide path fabrication. And you know what? Sometimes you can just take your glide path file. This is a wavable glider and, you know, go straight, straight to your working length and be done. And then there's other times where that will not do anything. It's almost like there's a dead stop. So let's talk about, you know, look at that curve. Isn't that amazing? This file is like a total wet spaghetti noodle. You know, before we clean and shape and get our primary or medium files down to length, Let's talk about glide path fabrication and in those cases that are really difficult. So this is, we're going to talk about difficult glide path, fabric, you know, maintaining and keeping, keeping that glide path. So this case here, so this is one of those plastic teeth and this is the MB1 route and this is the MB2 route. So let me talk just about a couple little tips that I was taught about when you're dealing with just working length and, and other little things. So. 40% of the time, the MB1 route joins the MB2. So 40% of the time, these two are what we call confluent. Now, that means 60% of the time, they're not. Now, if they're not confluent, you can usually predict that if you've got the MB1 length, MB2 is going to be about a millimeter short. And it's just literally due to anatomy. You can see that uh, there's just, it's literally, you, you know, it's down the slope of the, of the, of the root, root canal peak, if you may. The other thing is, is that almost 100% of the times there are isthmuses in these teeth between the different, these two or uh, two canals. So if you're going to, you know, withdraw your irrigant from one canal and you see it come up from the other one, don't be fooled. I've been fooled before. These canals might not be confluent. It may just be confluent at the isthmus, but their, their portals of exit might not be, might not be the same. So just keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and take a look at creating our glide path. So start up, what we're going to do is we're going to, just for safety, we're going to be cleaning and shaping the coronal two thirds of our, of our root canal. And what I'll do is I'll start cleaning and shaping, especially on a maxi molar. I'm going to clean and shape the three main canals. So just mesial buckle. This is the mesial buckle one root. MB2 is here. This is the palate. So I'm going to clean and shape MB1, DB, and the palatal root to make sure we get all that cleaning, uh, we get vital tissue debridement and dissolution before I start tackling the MB2 root. So what I do for orifice creation, I'm going to use that, you've seen this before, I'm going to use the wave and goal primary. What that does is it opens the orifice, but it also opens the coronal two thirds. So you can see here, I'm going to take that file, we're going to, and it's incredibly flexible. I'm going to clean and shape the coronal two thirds. And then what we did, and we know about that, so then what we're going to do is we're going to trough. So we're troughing for our MB2. So you see how the angle of that angle of that file comes off to the distal? Well, what we want to do is get that file to stand up a little straighter. So I'm going to trough a little more to the mesial with my Munt Spur, so my long, long shank round burr. And like we talked before, we're going to try to remove more of that shelf because what's happening is we're getting this file. You know, we probably moved a little bit of this right here. That file is still kind of making an angle. So we want to make sure 
that we don't hit this and ledge that case. So we're going to remove a little more of the mesial, a little more mesial uh, dentin, and you can see we've still got a little bit left here, but we're going to try with our eight file. And let's take a look from the side. It's standing up a little bit better and where we can go. So normally what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a six file in these cases, but for this one, this is about a year ago, I was using an eight. And what I'm doing is I'm just literally trying to watch wind that file down to the cutting fluid, which is six, 16 millimeters. And that tells me, there we go, we're just checking. You can see we got our cutting fluids there. That tells me that, yeah, we've got some space. There's no crazy things going on. I can get a file down there. So next, in these really tortuous, curvaceous cases, I'm going to use the Wave and Go glider. This thing is a super wet spaghetti noodle. It's incredible how flexible it is. And I'm just going to go to that 60 millimeters. It's on my cutting flutes at the top there. And then we're going to irrigate all the debris out. And then we're going to tackle that again with the Wave and Go primary. So again, what I'm doing is I'm just opening up the coronal two thirds. So when I, you haven't even seen me take a file to working length, I have not done that yet. This is a, such an easier technique that removes all the coronal interferences and off we go. So now what we've done is we've cleaned up all of this material. So our, when we try to watch wind our file, it's not binding anywhere here. So in the classic example of this MB2, what normally happens, it depends, it's like 50% of the time, I'll take a hand file, we'll, so we'll have clean and shape, the chrome two thirds, and I'll take a hand file and it stops right here. It's like bang. And then sometimes it hits here and sometimes it hits here. And it's really important to practice this in these extract, in these uh, plastic teeth because then you see what your file is actually running into. You have a better understanding. So from this image right here, you can see that not only are we trying to get that curve this way, so towards the MB1, so towards the buckle, we now also have towards the distal another curve as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our six file. I placed because I'm, you know, I've kind of cheated the system to be honest. I'm going to use a little hook. Normally I don't do this if I don't know the anatomy of the tooth, which is 100% of the time. But in these plastic teeth, I already know that I've got to try to get around this right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a little J hook bend, and I'm going to adjust my unidirectional stop to match where the bend goes. And then we're just going to slowly watch wind that down. So this is the way you can figure out how, which way the curve of your tooth is. If you're, if you can, if you take a straight six file or even with a subtle bend and it goes right to your working length, you don't have to worry about this. But in these cases where there is a hook like this, you're going to need to bend it, bend that file. So what I've done here is I'm going to talk about it in a second. I've used my unidirectional stop to figure out which way I need to turn the file every time we get it back in. But what happened is, is that once we get it past the working length, so we're, we've taken it out into the PDL, no one's gonna die, and we're gonna do this thing called smoothies. So we're gonna file or smoothies this file back and forth. And we're not gonna bring the, look at this, watch the second, the second I bring that file in too close and I haven't in the root and I haven't smoothed the path, it won't go back out. That's exactly what happens intraorally. You're kind of like, ah. So now I have to either rebend or get a new file. So I'm just going to rebend and try to sneak that file back to length. You can see I'm using my unidirectional stop. Boom. That's the best feeling. Right to the distal. And I'm going to do that filing again. So smoothies. Here I am again. It just gets caught. There we go. So I'm going to be a little less aggressive in my amplitude of filing or creating smoothies. And we're going to try to get that reproducible glide path. So it's, we're still binding internally. So what I'm going to do is I need to reset and rebend my file and readjust everything and then go back out again. This is normal life. It's just patience. So I'm going to switch that to the distal, try to watch, you know, try to feel around. That's what feeling around is essentially trying to make it go past that impediment. Oh yeah, best feeling in the world during endo. So what's happening right there is that it's been going out this portal of exit, but what's happening is that it's actually catching this one or vice versa. I think it's, oh, it's going out this one, but at this point it's actually catching the one that's a little more coronal. You can see it grabbing there. 
and you know in real life you just put a lot of pressure and then you get this file that comes out and looking at like a little like a little circle so i can't get that file back to length i'm not going to push and actually what i'm going to do here is i would normally go back to a six file i'm going to try going to an eight with a little more of a hook on it i do adjust my unidirectional stop to match where the hook is the j hook and then go back down the canal i'm going to slowly make my way you can see me you know kind of feeling my way and boom unidirectional stops to the distal and we're going to keep that filing so again we've got to keep those amplitude strokes really small keep it out of the out of the tooth making that file and there we catch that again and watch this so i caught that other portal of exit and boom <laughs> we've made a 90 degree bend inadvertently so i'm going to pull that out and how many times have you seen this on an 8 file or a 10 file i'm sure you've seen it many times and i know i've seen it even in a circle so that's one of the reasons why that's happening it's catching an impediment or catching another portal of exit or catching a lateral or something and it's doing a little bend so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my 10 file i'm going to do the exact same bend exact same way we're going to try to fish that down to the apex portal of exit and it's not going so i need to readjust my bend a little more of a cute bend and then we're going to watch run that down there try to get that out i'm going to place my unidirectional stop to the distal and sometimes you just got to either fish around to get that out or redo your bend like you can see here it's not going so i got to re-bend this is like literally how it is All right, so we're going to try that one more time. We're going to pull up. There we go. Booyah. Right to the distal. Beautiful feeling. So I got that file about a millimeter out. We're going to continue that smoothies. And we're going to get a continuous glide path. And then what we're going to do, I mean, during the process, we're going to be doing this anyways, checking to see if we're at working length. So that's what I'm going to do here. I flatten the cusp tip so you can see it's flattened. We're going to place our apex locator on. It's going to be beeping like mad which is a great feeling when you're trying to make this manual glide path and then we're just going to adjust it and then place our rubber stop we're going to go to one red bar and then we're going to do our measurements so if, on these curved cases you got to flatten out that file flatten out the curve on your file and i just wanted to point out this is 18 19 20 on the marks on the file and this is 22 so you can see we're at 20 millimeters which match, matches on the endo ring so we're going to put our cutting, I think I'm going to do the working length to, in this case it was 19 and a half. It might have been 19, I can't remember. This is about a year ago. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our wave and go glider right to our working length. And you can see the beautiful reproducible working length reference point. So there's that. And then we're going to use it in our... There we go. We're going to go right to length. I'm actually going to take it a millimeter long. We can talk more about that later. So there's that. And then we're going to do our working, do our initial cleaning and shaping. And then that's done with our wave and go primary. So what I talked about just briefly was taking this file. So this is a 15 tip. Uh, and when I have a really difficult time trying to get patency, what I'm going to do is I actually might take it a little bit long, a by one mil, a half millimeter or one millimeter. And that makes sure that I get patency. That's a more of an advanced technique and you can totally try it. Just be careful you don't break off that tip outside the root. And then once we're done that, we're going to irrigate with our sodium perchlorate. We're going to recapitulate. One of the key things here is to see is all this debris that's stuck at the bottom. So we're going to recapitulate, try to break all that up. That's the beauty of using sonics and even ultrasonics. We're going to make sure we have patency, re-irrigate, and we're done. So then we are next to placing our calcium hydroxide. Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right, let me go back to my thing here. So... That gives you a bit of a uh, technique about um, using glide path. And that really talks about 
you know, a glide path if you can get down it. So this is, if you haven't seen it, this is a video that I put online. And this is a case that I recently did where I blocked myself out and it, it happens. And hopefully if you haven't watched it, take a look. I'm not going to talk about it now. And it gives you, we're going to use a 6810 technique. I know that uh, Captain Trevani, I don't know if I can't I can check to see if he's on here, said he used it just recently. And uh, actually uh, one of our endodontists, he was a uh, AGD and he went back to endo school. Major Les Campbell taught me that technique. So it's really helpful. Watch the video. That's extremely helpful. Another video that I wanted to talk about that I uploaded, we're not going to talk about it here, is this um, the full question and answer uh, from Ali Nase from Real World Endo. And he really talks about apical size preparation. I think that's something that's critical to talk about. Uh, I know in the course and in, I know, uh, well, I know for myself, I'm going to open everything up to a 35. I just want success right up front. Whether that influences success or not, you can argue that left, right, and center. But take a look and listen to what he says about opening uh, to different sizes. He also talks about placement of calcium hydroxide because one of my questions is, do you need to pack it down there or can you just use a 10 file to get it to length? And of course, he really brought BC Sealer to market. And he has a, I, I, asked, we pre, I emailed him before and asked him to talk about BC Sealer. So um, it's interesting that you know he brought... He actually asked Brasser to uh, sponsor them. That's really, Brasser's not controlling them. It's really um, him controlling Brasser, but it's really real world endo and his experience and evidence using uh, BCC. So go ahead and watch that. And this is one last case. I was going to send this to you, Reagan, I know, and I totally forgot. So this is, I saw this on Facebook. There's lots of really fancy stuff on Facebook. Um, this is one case that just happened, I guess it was in Belgium. And this patient presented with tooth number two six, and it needed a retreat. Now you could argue whether you just take it out or not, but this is the I'm going to play this video just so you can take a look at it. So this is the situation here, and I think this is really appropriate. I've watched it a few times; it goes pretty fast. I can I'll post it, I'll upload it to the workplace. Um, I'm not sh I'm assuming this is an endodontist office, uh, but I think it. The reason why I'm posting this is because it falls in line with what we're we are attempting to accomplish with pharmacotherapy in advance. When you have and you have a situation where it doesn't, um, the pharmacotherapy therapy is not working. The video stopped, Ash.
Okay, so that was a uh, I found that actually quite interesting that video there. And um, so there's a couple points I just want to mention that um, you know you could question the restorability of that tooth, uh, but and then the next question is, do you just take it out or do you actually do the endo and have the patient be okay? The other point that I wanted to bring up is that there was an article in the Journal of Endodontics within the last like four months that talks about there's been no actual clinical trials to see whether or not incision and drainage. I know we talk about incision and drainage, but just throwing this out here because, you know, why not? And we teach it, uh, but there's a, and I'm going to post in the workplace, there's no actual evidence to suggest that incision and drainage is actually necessary. So they, this, this randomized controlled trial, clinical trial, actually tested the difference between incision and drainage, endo and incision and drainage, and just endo. And, you know, you'll be actually, take a look at the, at the results. It's actually quite interesting. So food for thought. And the last thing is I just noticed there are no hand files in that video because hand files are not sexy these days. So that concludes what I'm going to talk about. And the next part is I'm going to leave with Major Meadows. She really is going to talk about, so we've talked about getting our glide path, but what happens when you come to a dead end and you're just poking, like trying to take your file and trying to poke holes into that sign. So she's got a great technique that um, she taught me. So I'm going to switch over to her. I'm going to mute myself. You got it there? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Uh, yeah, one sec. All right, there we go. So I'm not going to, this is not my technique, as Major Mark keeps saying, but. Uh, I did introduce it to him, or I it did introduce him to it, but it was one that I learned on residency while I was in residency. And um, it's really been beneficial when you're dealing with some of those complicated cases. Um, I am gonna just go back to um, that video he just played for us in that um, they were using a, a, a um, hand piece without any water. Um, and so to try to pr probably prevent uh, aerosols so you can think how you could limit the amount of aerosol that you're doing, uh, especially if you're going to get ready to do um, non-surgical root canal therapy. Um, you could look at using a, an electric hand piece, um, and then you could potentially not use any water. Um, and then if you're going to rinse the tooth, you could just use a monoject syringe um, and try to refrain from using the air water syringe and just try to dry if you have to do additional drying, um, use your suction with the micro tip, and then you could also just use a cotton pellet. So again, think of ways that you can reduce the amount of aerosol. We also had talked about previously, um, just you could take the a cotton pellet with some sodium hypochlorite um, and um, just uh, kind of clean the tooth off before you even start the end of procedure. So I don't know if this video was made during COVID times, but just looking at that video, I was got to thinking like we don't necessarily need an air um, and um, aerosol generator using an air driven handpiece. We could go to the electric. We could use monoject syringe with just some water to rinse it, trying to keep the aerosol production down as low as possible. Oh, you mean like to yeah. cool the burr down? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, like if you wanted to cool the burr down or to get rid of like the debris afterwards, oh. do you know what I mean? Like you're, we're notorious for using air water syringe to- Oh, yes. The tooth. So use a monoject syringe with just sterile water, water to clean the debris. Like you can see there's full of debris there. Yeah, like I, right here, I see what you're talking about. I didn't know I what would, the hell you were talking about, to be honest. I'm like, why is she using saline? Were we going backwards here? No, no, I'm just saying on the- so to prevent from using your air water syringe, that's what I'm trying to. Yeah, that's a good idea. Anyway, you can go back to the other part there, if you don't mind. Yeah, you. Got, uh, that's a great idea. I appreciate you mentioning that. And one last piece I it reminded. Um, so you notice that um, they use Teflon. So I've actually stopped, not stopped fully, but the, the beauty of using Teflon or just calcium hydroxide in place of your provisional restoration on top is that there are no little like fibrils coming out of here because the fibrils can also wick. I mean, there's been no, I don't know, I should research to see if there's any um, articles about leakage of bacteria through those little cotton pellets, you know, little fibrils, but using, te I mean, Teflon's incredible in, in dentistry. 
Um, so it might be, you know, just keep in the back of your mind, even just use Teflon. All right, so let's get back to the dead end. Mm, let's go to... So you could even use this technique that we're going to review where, um, and Major Mark kind of covered it a little bit where he was going, putting a bend in his file and, 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 and trying to get to the, uh, to achieve patency in that last case. Um, it's not playing there, Ash. Yeah, this one sec. Is it better now? Uh, you can see it in small, so yeah. we can keep. I got a little it. girl staring at me through the window. <laughs> Let me go here. All right. Okay, so as a uh... oh, it disappeared. Sorry. Okay, never mind. I'm gonna mute myself, yeah. and then uh, I gotta go talk. To Okay, perfect. Um, so as we've already talked, we enlarged the coronal two thirds and I don't know about all of you, but I wasn't taught this in dental school. I was never taught to enlarge the coronal two thirds prior to trying to get to my working length. But as Major Mark had stated, like this is a big game changer. If you enlarge your coronal two thirds, then you can get your hand files, um, have a greater ability to get your hand files because one of the biggest jumps in sizes is from a 10 to a 15 hand file. So there'll be mo lots of times when you, before we started enlarging the chrono two thirds, um, if we were using hand files, you would go in, you'd put your 10 and then you wouldn't be able to get to that 15 because there's such a great jump in the size of the, the coronal aspect of that file. So by doing the coronal enlargement, you're taking that, um, problem away. So once you've enlarged your chrono two thirds with your primary wave one gold file, um, or you could you could go up to the, the medium. I usually just stick to the primary. Um, and then you're ready to scout your apical one third. So you can, that's when you're trying to find your, um, uh, your, your working length, sorry. You go to the next slide, Ash. So this is just showing us now taking a number six file, trying to get it down to working length. Um, I always start with a six. Um, that's again, something I started in residency. Some people choose not to, some people are comfortable starting with a, an eight or a 10. Um, but I find, especially in molars where we have, uh, deltas and, um, dilacerations that a six is, uh, usually the best to start with. Okay. So next slide there. So what you're going to encounter sometimes is a six hand file will stop then the tracks. And so I'll tr sometimes try an eight because sometimes a six can be uh, too flexible. And um, so then I'll try an eight and I won't go any further. If I can't get past the block at this point, I won't keep going up against that block because you're just going to make it worse. And I'm just put the roots at X on there. Uh, just to show that that's often what you'll end up seeing is that you just can't get any closer to your patency length. Um, next slide. So often people will say that the canal is calcified in the apical portion, but if you were able to get down the file from the top, like the from the uh, the orifice opening. Canals don't calcify from the apex coronally, they calcify the opposite direction. So it's not calcified in this in this area. There's just an anatomical change in the canal and your file just can't negotiate it at this time. There's just not enough room uh, to try to bend the file into these areas. So you can see some of the, the illustrations of what on the left hand side there of what your apical terminus actually looks like. Um, and there's no way you're going to be able to clean out all of those. And that's why we rely heavily on our irrigant and all our, all our ultrasonics, um, to really clean those out. But you will usually find one main path. If you look at the radiograph on the right hand side there, uh, on the, the, I think it's a distal route that you see that it splits there. And normally like if you had your hand file there you could potentially be coming up to the junction of that v and uh, that could be what you're coming up against so um you need really need to try to find another technique to try to get down into those areas so next slide 
So, and as, as Major Mark said before, like how many times have you put a file in and then you pull it out and it's bent just because you know that there's some kind of blockage or, or just change in anatomy where you're just not able to negotiate past. Next slide. So what we need to do is we need to slowly enlarge the area coronal to the stop so that you can increase your working diameter so you can maneuver your file. So you need to try to, you wanna step back basically from the stop and make that area a little bit wider so that you could put a curve in your file and try to find where that file is gonna drop. Similar to, kind of similar to what Major Mark was showing you earlier about trying to get to patency in the canal. So next slide. So what I do is I measure two millimeters back from the block, okay? And then I'm gonna work my six and then my eight and my 10 and my 15 hand files with a slight curve in it because I'm trying to hopefully find maybe the block, maybe there's a little pathway even further back, but I'm just hoping that I can scrape along the walls enough that I'm cleaning everything and I will be able to potentially drop in once I get closer to the, once I get to the block. So you're gonna, again, two millimeters away from the block. Um, next slide. Then you're gonna take your, your wave one primary, two millimeters from the block. Next slide. Then you're gonna take your um, wave one medium, which is 3506 taper, two millimeters coronal to the block. And then next slide. And then here, this is where I'll take a pair of ortho bird beak pliers. Um, and then I'll put a small curve in my hand file in the direction of the unidirectional stop and Major Mark already covered the reason for doing that. Um, and then I'm actually going to where the blockage is. And about, I would say about 60% of time at this point, I'm usually able to get by the blockage uh, with a six or eight. If I still can't get by with a six or eight, um, then I, I, what I do now is I, I start the process over and you can go to the next slide. Um, if, I, if I'm not successful, I do the process over, but I repeat it just one millimeters from the blockage. Um, so, but if I am successful, then I'll do smoothies prior to taking the file of the canal. So smoothies is a term that um, basically what it's meaning is that you're going in and out of the canal um, at the apex to ensure that you have that reproducible glide path. There's nothing more frustrating than finding that, getting through that blockage and then you pull your file out right away and then you can't get back into it again. So before you actually take the file out, you wanna do about 30 smoothies to ensure that you have that reproducible glide path. So again, next slide. So again, I'm not, I won't go through the whole process again, but basically now I'm measuring one millimeter back from the block. Um, and then you're gonna work your six, eight, um, 10, 15 files with a slight curve. And then you're gonna go through the whole process again. And nine times out of 10, I find that you're successful at this point. Um, if you're not successful, that's when I'll jump to the C files. And I think someone, I saw a chat jump up when um, Major Mark was, video was playing, because you could see he was using C files. And um, C files are just a bit stiffer, a, a stiffer stainless steel file. Um, and they'll grab onto the dentin a little bit um, harder. You'll find that the K files, they flex and they bend a bit too much. So if you're just trying to get past a little area, uh, I, I'll move to a C file. Um, if you want to go to the next slide there, Ash. I think, yeah, and I, I talked about the, the C file. So basically here, you just want to um, twist the, in a, in a pull manner, like you, not, not like a watch winding or not like a balance force technique. Um, the only thing is you have to be careful if you're not used to using C plus files, they are a lot, of, a lot stiffer and you can create your own ledge if you use them too early on in the process. So um, sometimes when we're trying to find that initial MB2 or get that MB for that stick for the two, will you all use a C plus file? I don't know about Major Mark. Um, 
but because they, they don't bend as easily as the regular K flex files. Um, so I really find that technique works. Um, it's kind of similar to the 6810 technique um, when you're trying to slowly get down a calcify canal, but you just have to be remember that you want to work back from that blockage because if you keep just ramming up to that blockage, you're just going to end up either creating your path, your own path and perforating somewhere or um, like perforating the, the side of the tooth or you're going to just create your own uh, um, exit from the root. Yeah, you know what, Reagan, the, I just wanted to mention a thing. Um, you talked about C plus files and C files. So um, so the, what you've been talking about is C plus, which are super, super duper. And the, I think the question was C, C files. So was it C or C plus? C files, because in the video I was using C files and literally it was just because uh, that's what we had in the... <laughs> But you're right. C files are are stiffer than regular, so they're by lexicon, by densify. Um, they're a little bit stiffer. But you've been talking about the C plus, which are about two percent stiffer, and they're active. Same. Yeah, they have active end cutting tip. Vice the the K flex files don't. Yeah. They can do some good damage. Those guys. Yeah, if you're not careful. Absolutely. But they have their use. But some people use them routinely. Um, but again, just make sure you're careful with them. All right. So is that all you got to say? I do. That is it. Did you have a case we were talking about? You said you're going to share it. Or are you, are you nervous? No, I'm not nervous. I kind of forgot about it, but I can try to bring it up on my <laughs> but now You won't be able to see it because I don't. I don't know how to share my screen and all that kind of stuff. I can share it for you. Anyways, can you talk about it? I was just, I, I can try to show how it's calcified and then I'd have to find the picture. Uh, assign, make presenter, Reagan, mm -hmm. Meadows, boom. Change presenter. Passing privileges to you. Oh, there's only one person I can see on here other than you and me. It's Carlos. He's always on his video. What's up, buddy? I can read lips. Sounds like you're doing good. So go ahead. I think you have control there. I'm trying to bring up a slide. To show, oh, and I can show the case that I used the technique on, but All right, cool. just give me a second. It's not mind-blowing, but... Can show you that it works. So, just an aside, um, like the, the CEO said, we're going to be uh, doing perio emergencies next, next week at the same time. And let's see, are there any questions going on? It's like pretty. Uh, let's see. C file, yes. Okay. So, I guess we'll just well, she's monkeying around with her thing there. Um, so, there's a regular eight file, a regular K file. Then there's a C file and then there's a C plus file and there's all different variations. There's all different companies. There's, you know, there's so many different things. So what I, I honestly, my recommendation to you is go back to your clinics someday, go ahead and, you know, look in the drawer of a million, you know what I'm talking about? The million endo files. You've got a million headstrom files, a million like of everything and just search and see what different kinds you can find. What are the symbols that are on the files? Because often you'll find Hedstrom file, you're, you know, you're, you ask your dental assistant to go look for a 40 file and they come back with a Hedstrom file and you're like, ah, but, and you open the package and you finally figure out it's a Hedstrom file. But actually, if you look on the, on the packaging, the symbology for a Hedstrom file is a circle. Or they'll add, they'll, you'll be like, can you go get me a 15 file? Or you'll be searching for a 15 file and you get it back and you pull it out of the package and it's like nickel titanium. You're like, uh, I didn't want a nickel titanium 15 file. Super flexible. It's really cool. I could play with this. You know, it's really neat to play with, but I really need something, a, a regular stainless steel file. But if you look on the package before you opened it, the stainless, the nickel titanium hand files are actually half, the little square is half dark, half black, half white as compared to a K file is a full square or a diamond, depending if you're using K flex files. So, you know, take a look at your hand files, what you have in your clinic 
um, see what the symbology is on the outside, you know, get an idea and then pull these files out because I know that every clinic I've been to has 50 billion KFlex files. I don't know who's KFlex filing and we just keep storing them, but pull those files out and see what they're like to use. And because that's, there's nothing more that you can do is just go ahead, look through your endo cabinets while we got some downtime, organize it all and check it out, check out for these files. Any luck there, Reagan? Uh, not really. Sorry. Well, I can, well, here, I can show this, but I don't know. So how do I, sh sorry guys, I'm not very, how do I show it now? You just go, uh, you should be able to just go, I presented it to you. I passed you the, I passed you the baton. And then, there's nothing on here that says share my screen or nothing, eh? No. Participant, anyone can share. Let me see if I can control. Oh, wait. Maybe this is it. Oh. 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 Oh, my gosh. We did it. I can't believe it. Okay. I don't know if I have video. Just leave it the way it is. It's perfect. Okay. So as you can see in this case, I may have showed this case already. Um, oops, sugar, sorry. It, it looks a bit calcified from the coronal and you can, can't really see a lot on the distal aspect of that canal. But eventually I was able to get down. Um, and this was a case where I did the six, eight, 10 technique that we've already talked to you about. So slowly working your way down to find uh, a path. Um, if you look at this radiograph, can you see my mouse? Yes. On the screen? Okay, so if you look at this radiograph, you can almost see distal to this file. It looks like there's still calcified material in there. Um, so this was a case where I was not getting uh, patency and I did have to go ahead, work two millimeters back from the blockage, um, and then one millimeter back from the blockage, and then I was able to finally get my patency. And then you can see the final radiograph on, on the right-hand side there. So it, it definitely is a technique that works. And as Major Mark had said before, um, it can be very frustrating, but you have to have patience when you're doing endo. It's beautiful if the case goes um, very nice and smooth, bang, you're down to the apex, but a lot of times you won't be. And so these little tech, little tips, I guess, we're sharing with you are the ones um, that will help you negotiate some of these uh, harder cases. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Regan. That was great. I wanted to point out, um, Along the algorithm, I'm gonna. There's actually an endodontist online, and I uh, found his algorithm. So if you can't, so say for example, we're come to the end of the road, and you still can't get down there. Well, a couple points you need to think of. Consider, you know, is a case vital? Was it vital or not vital? That's a huge, you know, indicator of. Oh, we could see your email, and you. I know. So, you know, can you? Is the case? Oh, see our email again. I love it. Let me. Just, We'll stop sharing your screen there. And so can you, you know, is the, let me go back here. Okay, so, so is the case, let's go to the discussions, that's all I have. So is the case vital or not vital? So if it's vital and you're stuck, that, you know, probability of having success is pretty high. The problem really comes when you have a necrotic case or partially necrotic then you kind of got to think like, oh, well, now what am I going to do? So sometimes if the case is vital, is it really worth battling? I mean, if you're five millimeters away from the, from the apical constriction, well, you're probably not going to have success. But if you're within the ballpark of two millimeters from the radiographic apex, you're probably going to have decent success on in that case. So you can choose to either finish the case or you can choose to place calcium hydroxide. You may actually have a block that is made up of combination of organic and inorganic material. And calcium hydroxide, if you get it down to the constriction, if you can get the calcium hydroxide down there, it will dissolve, break down some of that organic tissue. So you go when you go back, you may actually be able to get through that. 
Now, probability hap probability of that happening is probably pretty low because you know you probably you know you hammered away with a 10 and 15 file and ledged it. But so my point is just go easy with this with the small files. Take your time, and now you have some idea about bending. And go into your clinics or take some plastic teeth from home and just practice the bending. The file bending technique will make your life so much different. So if it's a non-vital case, it's necrotic, there's a lesion, you know, probably don't want to finish that case if you can't get within a millimeter of that radiographic apex. Uh, I'm not saying you need patency, but the probability of having success is higher if you have it. So in those cases, I would place calcium hydroxide because honestly, um, I've had a couple of cases I couldn't get patency, placed calcium hydroxide for a week, refreshed it for another week, waited for a couple for a month and then it started to heal and you just think whoa this these endo things i don't understand of course during real time now we're talking about covid right so in the real world when we get back to um some sort of post-pandemic kind of situation then obviously you're either going to refer that to your endodontist to see if they can successfully bypass it or talk to your oral surgeon if it's worth I mean, even your AGD to see if, if the tooth is restorable. If it's not restorable, then you may not even waste the time of going down the road of trying to finish this endo and just, okay, well, maybe we'll extract this tooth. Do you have any points on there, uh, Reagan? I know the um, talking about the vital versus the necrotic cases, um, I think it's really good. Um, it's also um, that video that uh, actually showed us at the first from LA say mm -hmm. um, he talked about it well um, one of the other things that he talked about too is um, and that I had wanted to bring up was the fact that we all know that we need to keep our irrigation syringe tip mm -hmm. um, very loose in the canal when we're irrigating so you're moving it apically coronally you're never leaving that irrigation tip uh, um, stuck in one place um, so the other thing that you want to make sure you're careful with too is with your calcium hydroxide and also if you're doing the hydraulic condensation technique um just making sure that that tip is moving as well if not you can risk getting some nice um ex extrusions out the apex um and uh like pc sealer is a very uh biocompatible sealer um but uh the ph of calcium hydroxide is pretty high so really don't want it to be going out the the apex of the tooth if at all possible yeah that's a good point actually okay. you just have to be especially be careful on those that have lesions because if you have a lesion most likely you have some apical resorption as well yeah absolutely and uh i'm gonna put up a video you brought up a really good point i'm gonna put up a video and we're kind of running out of time with our endo series um but we t i talked about it with um Captain um, Shivani, he's here, says he's here. I can't remember if I talked with him or Lucas Smith. Um, talking about if you have a large anterior case, let me just pull this up actually real quick. Uh, here it is right here. We'll just talk about it real quick. So um, this case here, we did the retreat on, but the problem is, is that because there res was resorption on the, you can see my baby dog there sleeping. I can't really sign it. Anyway, so because of resorption of the apex, there was a lesion. Um, there was, we had an enlarged apex. So, I mean, we can, this is a really interesting discussion, whether or not we save this tooth, extract it. This is a crown. This is a crown. Uh, anyways, we did the retreat. Blah, 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 blah. So this is really what the point was here is that you can see now I've ended up at a 70 file creating that apical stop. And what I'm doing afterwards because we remove the gutter percha is we're going to clean the sides of the canal maybe i'm just going backwards here so you'll be able to see all the debris lots of irrigation all the debris on these files and that's what we're looking for literally when we're doing this my my 4505 isn't doing anything it's not hitting the you can see all the debris that's coming out but what we really needed to do was create an apical stop with a 70 file. So we worked up from a 50 to a 60 to, to 55, 60 to a 70. And now what I'm doing, and this is applicable to those large anterior cases where you can do, you know, you can place your 3506 down, down range, but it's not going to do anything. So what I'm doing here is I'm literally 
creating an apical stop with a larger file. So I picked this file because when I went to push it apically, it didn't go any further. What I'm doing here is I'm actually debriding the internal surface of the canals, and now I'm getting clean dentin. I don't see any more necrotic stuff. I'm getting clean, fresh cutting. Uh, we are going to extrude this tooth, and we're going to place a we were going to do an immediate implant, but uh, COVID has actually changed this, so I'm actually ortho-extruding this tooth. But the point is, is that what Major Meadows has said is that now I have a 70 size apical stop. My apical constriction is probably like a 55. You've got to be really careful of extruding stuff out the end. Really important. So making sure you bend your irrigating needle at the appropriate level. Um, you can see it's bent, it actually has two bends in this situation here. So I initially bend my irrigating needle at 18 millimeters, and then my secondary bend now is actually at like 13 because working like this 14. Do you have any points on that? Yeah, Did I just can. cut you off? Yeah. What? I got so excited about showing that video. I forgot if I cut you off. No, it's okay. Um, setting an apical or establishing an apical stop is really important in some of these large, uh, larger canals. Um, if you have any questions on how to do that, feel free to send, uh, Ash or I an email. I find it's easier for me to draw it, vice explain it verbally. But uh, yeah, basically you're trying to create that stop for your gutta percha, and sometimes you're gonna have to make a custom cone. Oh, um, well, your magical but, words. Look at that. <laughs> Check this. That's, out. Is that's some of the things that we uh, we well, he's got it right there. But um, that will we cover on the endo course, and then there's multiple ways of doing it. Um, you can put some eugenol, or not eugenol, eucalyptus, sorry, uh, and 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 to soften your gutta percha points, and then actually put it in the canal a couple times to try to refit that. Um, just because we don't, and then the other thing is you can get some of the, um, you can order some of the bigger cones like the hundred and tens, nineties, and things like that, and 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 ensuring that you fit it and make sure that it's giving you that stop too. So, and you can see he, there, he's created his custom cone. A custom cone. One of the things that you might not, add, and in these larger cases, because we're talking about it, uh, you can actually cut your gutta percha points, not your gutta percha points, you can cut your, cut your paper points mm -hmm. uh, to the size that you've created your apical stop. And we're talking about the apical stop because it's important in these larger cases, if you see these cases during the COVID, that you debride the apical part because you can still again you can open up to a 10 a 15 file and then be like okay i'm done but you still haven't gotten that necrotic partially necrotic debris down there so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use my use my gutta gauge we're going to cut that gutta per, uh what's that thing called paper point uh we're going to cut it to a 70 and then i know that we're drying and i'm also using this i'm going to take my cotton forceps and i'm going to measure to see where it's wet whoops measure to make sure i'm at right, right length and then, like Major Meadows said, we did our custom cone. Make sure you put it in the right way because you're essentially taking an impression of the integral surface of the canal. And then, if you're going to place, be, you're going to place, do your obturation. I don't recommend injecting it. And if you're going to place calcium hydroxide, be like she said, be very careful. So what I do in these cases, I just place it on the cone, pump it a few times, and then that's it. I'll take my working length radiograph. If you're going to place it on if you're placing calcium hydroxide, be careful. You might want to cut, you know, you could cut a gutter percha point and use that to pack it apically um, because you, it's wide open. Any points on that, Reagan? Uh, no, it's good. Awesome. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? Because we're at noon, so we got a couple minutes here just before we shut it down. Any other points, questions, comments? Been a lot of fun. Let's see, what we got here. I'm, I'm sorry. How do, how do you custom your uh, cones again? Okay, who's this? Um, Andrew. Andrew, how's it going? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Ashley? Yeah, great to hear from you, my friend. Long time. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Long time. Uh, so what we did just briefly. I'm gonna post this video on the workplace. Uh, I'll do it. It'll be more in depth, but essentially. Um, so really the idea in this situation, okay, was I put my map, I put this large cone, I, so I cut, cut the apex, I, I size it to a 70 with my gutta gauge, right? 
placed it in there and I'm thinking, man, look at the size of the hole in there. This is like a little, you know, it's like a little hole, little cork in a huge hole. So I'm like, okay, let's, I don't really like the backfill technique. I'm not really good at it, but what I am good at it is placing pieces sealer. And a really simple way I know how to solve this problem is make a custom cone. So essentially what I did was I took, yeah, so you can see the, the size of this. The next question that I'm going to answer for you is, is this restorable? And the question is questionable. She had this root canal done in Bosnia about 40 years ago. So, uh, and then Major Mishriki did the, uh, the build, the, the crowns about five years ago and she had this flare up. So what we did was I just essentially took two cones. I dipped them in, in uh, core form, just dipped them really quick. And then in they went and that's it. And I pumped it a few times. What's going to happen is you see how there's some gutta percha laying along the side there in like a liquid. So what happens is as the chloroform evaporates, this will slowly stick back to the main cone. So you'll see it here. I'll just hit play. And you can use eucalyptus oil as well. It just doesn't work as quickly as chloroform. So, and I know some clinics don't have chloroform anymore. Um, just but over it. If you have eucalyptus oil, um, you, it'll do the same, but it takes a little bit longer. So I'm letting it sit. You know, the thing is, is that I would honestly practice this on an extracted tooth before. So you can see there's still remnants. That's okay. It's going to get picked up. Practice on an extracted tooth before. See where you're getting your working length. See how this works. Because if you leave it in there, the problem is if you leave it in there and it sets and then you have an undercut, it's a real pain in the neck to get that thing out of there. So you mean kind of back and forth. And then the last thing is bend, you know, bend this a certain way or remember which way it goes in, like whether this gutta percha point is this way or bend one, you know, it, just make sure you know which way it goes in because once you have the BC sealer on there and you go to jam it back in, that's a very technical term and it doesn't go, it's frustration city. So just- You can uh, use two different colors of cones too. That's sometimes yeah. what I'll do. Well, that's a good point actually. Great point. So, yeah, so we extracted the screw this tooth, and I think we're just going to keep it because there's no implant going in anytime soon. So she's in the process of getting the extrusion right now. Does that help, Andrew? Yes, thank you. Um, and another question. You said, I'm not sure if I got it correctly at the beginning of the webinar, you said about draining, uh, there's no data supporting it. It's, what did I miss? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to post that in the workplace, and I'll let you read it. We're talking about incision and drainage. There's a randomized clinical control clinical trial that talks about whether you need to do incision and drainage or not. And it's just kind of for thought, food for thought. As long as you've already gotten drainage through the tooth, right? That, exactly, yeah. And started the root canal therapy. Yeah, the right. You always bring up those important points. <laughs> Keep you in check. What's the max apical size before MTA apical plug is needed instead of gutta percha? Man, that, that, I don't know. A great question. And, uh, I don't know if we tackle that today or we just tackle that. I don't know what the answer is to that one. I think if you can get an apical stop and. <clears throat> So this is a case here where I could have packed. I know that for regeneration, the evidence suggests that a millimeter, so a hundred size file, if you can send it out at the end, the idea for regeneration, I don't do regeneration. That's out of what I do. Uh, you can do that. So with an MTA plug, you know, it's a complicated technique. If you haven't practiced it, my advice is going to be trial it for yourself. If I think Reagan, you're going to agree with me on this. If you're thinking that it's going to need an apicoectomy, the idea is to pack MTA to the apex, and if the, the, the case does not resolve on its own because of whatever reason, extraradicular infection, uh, then you're easily, you can easily resect without having to do your retro prep. Every case that we did in residency that was at Apico, we'd go in and do the retreat. If the retreat wasn't successful, we would do a second retreat, but instead of filling it with gutta percha, you're filling the whole tooth with MTA. Um, unless you were going to be placing a post. Um, so, but that was, and then, so as Ashley said, if you're going to go ahead and do the apico, you don't have to worry about doing a retrograde fill. Your apic, you cut the three millimeters off the apex and you're good to go. You know, 
as a, I think as a brand new dentist, this is my advice is that, you know, I would recommend trying just this technique here. I'll post it on the workplace. If you've got, you know, keep it simple because honestly you can go, I don't know if you're going to be doing apicots. Uh, I do them here and there, but honestly, if you don't, unless you've got some really good training, you know, focus on the doing an awesome root canal. So focus because you can place your MTA plug and the endodontist is going to cut through that anyways and redo it. So rather than doing your frustration about practicing it, you know, doing it in real life, I would say in my humble advice would be, you know, try the, the techniques that are really straightforward. And then as you get with practice and experience and more training, then work on, okay, yeah, let's do the apical plug because now I've been trained on how to do the apico and do stuff like that. So my, my humblest advice is just work on, try this technique, get some extracted teeth, try this technique, uh, see if it works for you. And then let's go from there. I think that's pretty much my advice. Any other questions? Hopefully that answers your question there, Wang. Didn't really answer it. Okay, so that's pretty much it. And I'm grateful that everyone uh, showed up. Uh, you, you know, we're gonna continue the workplace for a little bit and all the information will be there. You know, Reagan, thank you so much for your help in this. I really appreciate it. I threw you on the spot and you just did it. So it's great. Always. Yeah, it is awesome. And if you have any questions, you can always get a hold of both of us. And the next, like I said, for the next, we're going to be having the next parts of webinars are going to be and perio emergencies, uh, some extraction techniques by our old surgeon in, uh, here. We're going to have some PPE stuff. We're going to have some quality patient safety stuff. And then we'll have our COVID Tiger Team leader, Major Fournier. He, or, uh, he's totally scared of coming online. I don't know why, but I'm trying to get him. Uh, and then we'll just keep this going. And if you have any ideas or any questions that you want answered, go ahead and just email the both of us uh, and go from there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Reagan. Any last points? No, I'm good. Thanks. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Take care. Stay safe. Bye.